We are back for our third segment with the Executive Vice President of SAG AFTRA. And before we went to break, I had to cut you off. I'm apologizing. Oh, well, no I let you do a great, a great line from, from, <laughs> from Star Trek of, that you did. But yeah. now um, continue on with what you were saying about new media and the challenge and going forward. Yeah, look, I mean, the industry, everybody involved in the industry is, is looking at, you know, how do we deal with this? Because what we're trying to figure out, what everyone's trying to figure out is, how do we monetize this shift to new media? Because our, our mature contracts are based you know, in our traditional formats where it's very easy to track the money, there's a lot of money involved, and that's not as apparent uh, in new media. You know, in the aggregate, that money is growing for sure, but it's harder to track. And there's gonna come a moment when all the people on the creative side are gonna look at management and say, guys, you're making a lot of money, and that money is obviously growing. Now, it's harder for us to figure out exactly how to track it, but we need to make sure that we have our fair share. And when that you know, clash finally comes, uh, if, if it's a significant sort of a, a, a moment in time where we have to say, this is where we draw the line, we are obviously in a much better position to wage that fight as one union. Okay, let's get to some uh, viewer questions. Let's see, we've got one from Act now, cry later. Hi, Ned. My question is, what is going to happen to residuals I'm getting for shows I've done governed by SAG and AFTRA under the merger? And now that we're one union, what are the odds of reversing the free run of no residuals for basic cable shows? Okay, so residuals on your uh, shows that you've previously done under SAG and AFTRA contracts are going to be paid just exactly like they always would have been. Um, so even after the new elections or what have you, it's going to... Yeah, no, th that's a so, function of the contract right. that the show was produced under. And okay. so those residuals are a function of that contract, okay. and they'll be con continue to be paid under those terms. Uh, dealing with basic cable is going to be a, a real good uh, place for us to uh, start developing our identity as SAG-AFTRA instead of SAG versus AFTRA. Isn't there like a 12-day run or something in basic cable? That after well, the two, the two unions had different approaches to basic cable. Uh, SAG basically had uh, one contract which we promulgated uh, for uh, cable producers. AFTRA took an approach where they would deal with producers on an individual basis and uh, would sometimes offer uh, terms that they would uh, ultimately bring up to you know, parity with their Exhibit A contract, or that was the goal over time. And you know, there's, there's something to be said for both approaches, and as we get into this, you know, we're going to have to uh, have our, our, our uh, negotiating staff and member involvement in making decisions about what are we going to do. I, I personally don't uh, love exhibition days, and to the degree that we can uh, get rid of them, I'd love to do that. I think it's a great example of competition working against actors yeah. in motion that can hopefully be reversed. Yeah. Let's see. Next up, we've got uh, Freeze... Uh, freezed it now, oh one. Are there going to be any changes on how to get into the union? So I think I may have mentioned before, um, anyone can kind of pay to get their way into after a SAG. Right. You had to do a certain amount of work. There were a few different ways to do it, but you had to work your way in, if you will. Mm -hmm. Is that going to change? or? Yeah, the uh, the membership uh, standards have changed because, as you as you said, uh, previously after was an open union, meaning uh, for for this purpose that anybody could go in and if they had the intent to become a performer in the industry, uh, they could write a check for the initiation fee and join. That's not true anymore. In SAG-AFTRA, you uh, either need to be working under our contracts or have previously worked under SAG or AFTRA contracts in a way that makes you eligible to join. Right. Uh, background performers will still uh, uh, enter through what's known as the three voucher rule that was mm -hmm. uh, familiar from SAG, and uh, that's really that's so, but, that's okay. it's much closer to the SAG uh, standard previously. Right, and then we covered uh, dues for existing members. What is it going to cost then to join? It's uh, three thousand dollars is the full initiation fee. Now, in some of the smaller markets, there will continue to be. Uh, discounted initiation fees, and then if you end up working outside of those smaller markets, you say you go to Los Angeles or New York and you work, then you have to pay the step up to the full initiation fee. So I think um, I actually initially joined SAG in Colorado, and I paid much less, and then right. I moved to LA. Mm -hmm. 
I had a nice little welcome to LA. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's like uh, when you come to the bigs, right. you got to pay to so, play so, in the right. bigs. But, of course. you know, and, and I have to point out that, you know, we've evolved to a uh, situation where to make a reasonable living in this business, certainly as an actor, you really were needing to be a member of both unions. And the initiation fee to join both unions was close to $4,000. So here again, uh, it's going to be cheaper uh, by about a thousand dollars, eight hundred and seventy-seven bucks, I think, to join SAG-AFTRA versus having joined SAG and AFTRA. And yeah, same principles what we were talking about before mm -hmm. with the dudes. And just to uh, age myself a little bit, um, <laughs> when I first joined the union, you had to be in SAG and you like to be an actor, but you, it, it wasn't as much of a necessity <clears throat> as it was today. Today, if you're an actor, you know, prior to you know the March thirtieth, yep. you did need to join. Really, both unions. That's right. Look, I mean, I I was a SA I joined SAG in 1986, and I didn't join AFTRA until 2000. I can't. It was either late 2002 or early 2003, and uh, I was just I was one of those who made my uh, living primarily in uh, movies and in prime time episodic dramas, and so SAG covered most of that work. I joined AFTRA in 2003 when I started doing some voiceover work and then I started working on cable shows under AFTRA contracts and uh, I've done a video game under AFTRA contracts and did a lot of voiceover work under AFTRA contracts. Well, speaking of video games <laughs> yes. and voiceover, we have a non-union related question coming in for okay. you. Chum Lodio would like to ask, a uh, question for Ned Vaughn, any stories about voicing L.A. Noir video game? <laughs> well, uh, I guess my favorite uh, story about doing L.A. Noir, which was a, a great experience. It was my first experience uh, uh, doing a video game. It was also my first experience doing motion capture, uh, performance capture, rather. We, uh, we did full performance capture for that uh, video game, and the technology is just remarkable. But my favorite uh, experience uh, coming out of L.A. Noir was that uh, I dropped my daughter off at school one day, and one of her friends ran up to the car and banged on the window and said, Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, you're Detective Larry. That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of so nice. So the Star Trek fans and the L.A. Noir video game. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just getting exposed to a whole new audience. Whole and, new and, and to be perfectly honest, I am I'm not a gamer. Uh -huh. And so I haven't actually played the game. But mm -hmm. I, I've gotten very good reviews from friends who have. Fantastic. Let's see. Rainer7 would like to ask. Um, a merger seems obvious as far as increasing leverage. Uh, why did it take so long? I think we kind of alluded to it, but... Well, you know, I, in, look, in 1998 and, and even in 2003, I, I think a lot of the reasons that we needed to do this were still speculative. You know, we had not engaged in this some real direct competition between the unions. There had been isolated moments. And there were still examples, you know, of performers who suffered from this divided uh, jurisdiction. I mean, you know, the, the community of singers, for example. SAC has lots of members who are singers or dancers who, uh, and, and do other uh, sorts of work where they would voice over performers, a perfect example. You know, you have voiceover announcers, they'll go and they'll record a spot, and if it was on the radio, it'd be an after a job, and if it, the same recording as a television commercial, it's a SAG job. And here you're splitting yourself again, uh, splitting your earnings, rather. Uh, so it was a little speculative still, though, in 2003. And then what happened, starting with the, some, you know, division of the cable television jurisdiction, and then uh, really especially what happened in 2008, 2009 with the primetime broadcast, people just understood this was headed in a bad direction, and we needed to turn it around. And for people who might not be aware, um, the threshold for approval was 60 percent, right? That's right. So even in 2003, I, I think the vote was at like 58 or 59 percent oh, in favor. It was, a, it was, it was it, a, it it missed by 57 and change. 57 and it and was change? it was a heartbreak because uh, yeah, it was a strong majority of both unions approved it, but SAG it, it came up the, just shy of that supermajority. It was literally 640 votes had gone the other way. Mm -hmm. That merger would have been approved, and I wouldn't have had to do this for the last four <laughs> years. <laughs> Website guy would like to ask, how do you take a non-union production and convince it to become union? Well, there's... So you were talking before about... Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there, there's, there's all sorts of approaches to that. Uh, you know, obviously the, the most important thing that a labor union does is it 
controls the labor force. It controls the labor market in, 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 an, in an area of work. And by doing that, if you can go to the group of people that the employers want to hire and say, guys, we simply, you're going to be better off. If you can convince those people that they're going to be better off working those jobs union. And I got to tell you, there's, a, there's an important aspect to letting the employers know that even though it might cost them a little bit more, they're actually getting value for that extra money that exceeds the money that they're paying. They're going to they're gonna be able to hire skilled performers that they can rely upon. It's going to make their productions go more smoothly, that they're going to get a better end product. By doing those two things in concert, that's how you put work under union contracts. I haven't uh, checked into it in a while. I know the WGA was working uh, towards unionizing uh, reality mm -hmm. showrunners and writers yep. in, in that area. That would obviously be a probably a big help to SAG-AFTRA sure. if somehow the WGA were to be successful in unionizing some of the reality people. Yeah, well look, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you've got these seven global media conglomerates that basically control the entertainment and media industries. And they have assets, you know, they've got publishing interests, they've got uh, uh, recording, uh, uh, re, you know, uh, music recording interests, they've got television networks, movie studios, the whole lot. and. They're, they look at it as a balance sheet. It is business to them. Of course, yeah. And, 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 and the deeper you can put your tentacles into those various assets across their entire area of business, the better off you are. So uh, this is, we, we've expanded our scope and that's gonna give us better leverage. Let's see, next question from Dragon Horse 46. Aside from new media, what other gains would you like to see for actors? Well, I wanna know if Dragon, Horse 46 is the given name. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I said in one of the last uh, <clears throat> live stream informational meetings that we had, and by the way, I mean, this is apt to talk about here. I, I was, we got such positive feedback from members about doing those informational meetings uh, live streaming. It really reached a lot of folks and it was great. And I said in uh, the last one, the reason that we're doing this is I want more money. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the, all, the, all the people who did this want more money. So all the gains that we want to make in new media and in our traditional contracts and, uh, you know, basically every area of work that we cover, that's the purpose for the union. And, of course, we're going to do that as vigorously as we can. I, I, I said, uh, you were talking about this quote earlier where I said, we're still going to have to fight smart and fight hard for every gain we want to achieve. We're just in the best position to do that now. Sounds good. Now, who's up in the next round of negotiations first? Um, which union? Uh, well, our next negotiation is the commercials contract. Uh, so that's, uh, that we're scheduled to begin those in October. Uh, the contract expires next spring in 2013. And, and are you before or after the DGA or the WGA? I don't know with regard to the negotiations with the JPC, and if you're referring to the AMPTP right. commercials, uh -huh. uh, co negotiations rather, uh, I, I really don't know. Okay. They, because the contract, you know, there's the contract exp expiration, but that doesn't necessarily dictate who goes first. Uh, you know, we did early bargaining for our, our contracts that last to 2014. I don't know how that's going to be okay. resolved. Well, the question we like to get people out of here on is, and I don't think we asked it of you of last time, so I'm excited to have you back. So we can add you to the library. What is your favorite set speak term? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's simple, but it's it's the one I like the most. It's and action. And the reason for that is that is the moment the juice really flows. That's when you get to play. That's when things start to happen. And I'm about action. Fair enough, and action has been taken, right? It has indeed. <laughs> it has our, indeed. our members took a great members action. Took action. Yep. And uh, last question, so for any more information on the, on the merger, the new website is sagafter.org? That's right, sagafter.org, and we got plenty there, and we're going to keep adding stuff so uh, members can get questions answered there. Certainly call, uh, call the union. And uh, your day job, you have any projects coming out, any TV shows, movies that we can do? Uh, yeah, the next thing that uh, I'm in is uh, The Newsroom, which is Aaron Sorkin and, and Scott Rudin's new project for HBO. I believe it comes on uh, June 24th. Fantastic. Ned, thanks so much again for coming on. I appreciate it. It's terrific to be here.
That is going to do it for this edition of Film Nut. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Ned Vaughn. And of course, all of you guys for watching and sending in questions. Actors, if you're watching, I would encourage you to check out websites like SAGAfter.org, but also SAG Watch and SAG Watchdog. They tend to offer different points of view, and it's your union, and it can't hurt you to stay informed. See you next time on Film Nut, and thanks again for watching. Thank you.